Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. The first one is the title story, and it starts like this. Living in a suburban neighborhood with an overactive homeowners association was never my idea of the American dream. But when my wife Sarah and I found our perfect starter home in Oakwood Estates last year, we thought we could put up with a few lawn height restrictions and paint color guidelines. Little did I know I was about to go head-to-head -head with the most power-hungry homeowner association president this side of the Mississippi. My name's Mike, and this is the story of how I took down a male stealing tyrant and saved our neighborhood from his reign of terror. It all started about three months after we moved in. I noticed our mail was arriving later and later each day. At first, I chalked it up to staffing issues at the post office. But then packages started showing up with ripped corners or slightly open flaps. Hey hon? I called out to Sarah one evening as I examined a box that had clearly been tampered with. Have you noticed anything weird about our mail lately? Sarah poked her head out from the kitchen, wiping her hands on a dish towel. Now that you mention it, yeah, my magazine subscription was a week late last month, and the corner was all bent up. I frowned, turning the package over in my hands. I think someone's messing with our stuff. You think it's kids? Sarah asked, coming over to take a look. I shook my head. Nah, this seems too, systematic, like someone's deliberately checking our mail before we get it. Little did I know, I was about to find out just how right I was. The next day, I decided to work from home and keep an eye on things. Around 2 p.m., I heard the mail truck pull up. I waited a few minutes, then casually strolled out to check the mailbox. That's when I saw him? Gerald Fitch, our esteemed homeowner association president, was rifling through my mail right there on the sidewalk. He was a tall, thin man in his 60s with a permanent scowl etched onto his face. Today he was decked out in his usual attire, pressed khakis, a polo shirt, and a look of disdain for anything that dared exist in his precious neighborhood. Excuse me, I said, trying to keep my voice level. What exactly are you doing with my mail? Gerald jumped, nearly dropping the stack of envelopes. He quickly composed himself, straightening his shirt and giving me a look like I was the one doing something wrong. Ah, Mr. Thompson, he said, his nasally voice grating on my nerves. I was just performing a routine security check. Can't be too careful these days, you know. I blinked, not quite believing what I was hearing. A security check? Of my personal mail? That's illegal, you know. Gerald waved his hand dismissively. Now, now, let's not get all worked up. As president of the Homeowner Association, it's my duty to ensure the safety and security of all residents. We've had reports of suspicious packages in the area. Suspicious packages, I repeated flatly. And that gives you the right to open other people's mail? I assure you, Mr. Thompson, everything I do is for the good of the community, Gerald said, puffing out his chest. If you have any concerns, you can bring them up at the next Homeowner Association meeting. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have other matters to attend to. With that, he shoved the stack of mail into my hands and strode off down the sidewalk, leaving me standing there in disbelief. I stormed back into the house, slamming the door behind me. Sarah looked up from her laptop, startled. Mike, what's wrong? I tossed the mail onto the coffee table and started pacing. You're not going to believe this. I just caught Gerald Fitch, that pompous homeowner association president, going through our mail. Sarah's eyes widened. What? Why? He claims it's for security reasons, I said, making air quotes. Can you believe that? He's violating federal law, and he acts like he's doing us a favor. That's insane, Sarah said, shaking her head. What are we going to do? I ran a hand through my hair, my mind racing. I don't know yet, but I'm not letting this go. No way. Over the next few days, I did some research. Turns out, tampering with mail is a federal offense, punishable by up to five years in prison and hefty fines. I also discovered that several other neighbors had noticed similar issues with their mail, but most were too afraid of Gerald's influence to speak up. I decided to attend the next homeowner association meeting to confront Gerald publicly. When the day arrived, I showed up armed with printouts of relevant laws and testimonies from a few neighbors who were willing to back me up. The meeting was held in the community center, a small building that looked like it hadn't been updated since the 70s. About 30 people were crammed into folding chairs, most looking bored or annoyed to be there. Gerald stood at the front, droning on about lawn care violations and the proper placement of trash cans. I waited impatiently for the open forum portion of the meeting. Finally, Gerald asked, does anyone have any other business to discuss? I stood up, my heart pounding. Yes, I do. I'd like to address the issue of mail tampering in our neighborhood. A murmur went through the crowd. Gerald's eyes narrowed as he looked at me. Mr. Thompson, we've already discussed the security measures. I cut him off. No, Mr. Fitch, what you're doing isn't a security measure. It's a federal crime. I held up my printouts. According to U.S. Code Title 18, Section 1708, obstruction of correspondence is punishable by up to five years in prison. That includes taking mail from a mailbox with the intent to obstruct correspondence. Gerald's face turned red. Now, see here, young man. I've been president of this homeowner association for 15 years. I know what's best for this community. 
Breaking the law isn't what's best for anyone, I countered. I have statements from multiple residents who've had their mail tampered with. This has to stop, or I'll have no choice but to report it to the postal inspector. The room erupted into chaos. Some people were yelling at Gerald, others were defending him, and a few looked like they just wanted to go home. In the end, Gerald grudgingly agreed to review the security policies, but I knew this wasn't over. The look he gave me as I left the meeting told me I'd just made a powerful enemy. Over the next few weeks, life in Oakwood Estates became interesting. Suddenly, every little thing about our property was under scrutiny. We got citations for our grass being a quarter inch too tall, for leaving our trash cans out 10 minutes past the allowed time, even for a small chip in our mailbox paint that I swear wasn't there the day before. This is ridiculous, Sarah fumed one evening, tossing yet another citation onto our growing pile. He's clearly targeting us. I nodded, my jaw clenched. I know, but that's exactly what he wants, to frustrate us so much that we back down or move out. Sarah raised an eyebrow. So what are we going to do about it? I grinned, an idea forming. We're going to catch him red-handed. The next day, I went to the hardware store and bought a small, discreet camera. I set it up inside our mailbox, angled to capture anyone opening it. Then, I prepared a special piece of mail. I created a fake letter from a law firm discussing a potential class-action lawsuit against homeowners associations. I made sure to make it look as official as possible, with a fake letterhead and everything. Inside, I placed a sheet of paper coated with a special powder that would stain hands blue on contact. Are you sure about this? Sarah asked as I sealed the envelope. I nodded. If he's going to act like a criminal, we're going to treat him like one. This is our home, and I'm not letting some power-tripping busybody drive us out. For the next few days, I obsessively checked the camera feed. Nothing happened. Gerald must have been laying low after the confrontation at the homeowner association meeting. But on the fourth day, bingo. I was at work when I got the alert on my phone. I quickly pulled up the live feed and watched as Gerald sidled up to our mailbox, looking around furtively before opening it. My heart raced as I saw him pull out the stack of mail, rifling through it until he came to my planted letter. He examined the envelope, his eyes widening as he read the fake law firm's name. Then to my immense satisfaction, he opened it. I wished I could see his face when he realized his hands were now stained bright blue, but the camera captured enough, his panicked movements, the way he shoved the letter back into the mailbox and practically ran away. I immediately called Sarah. We got him, I said, my voice shaking with excitement. Call the postal inspector. I'm on my way home. By the time I got back to Oakwood Estates, things were in full swing. A postal inspector's car was parked in front of our house, and a small crowd of neighbors had gathered to watch the drama unfold. I spotted Gerald standing on his front lawn, his arms crossed defensively. Even from a distance, I could see the telltale blue stains on his hands. The postal inspector, a no-nonsense woman named Agent Rivera, was just finishing up her examination of our mailbox camera. Mr. Thompson, she said as I approached, I've seen the video evidence, and, combined with the statements from your neighbors, we have more than enough to press charges. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and vindication. Thank you, Agent Rivera. What happens now? Mr. Fitch will be taken in for questioning, she replied. Given the evidence, he'll likely face federal charges for mail theft and tampering. As if on cue, two more official-looking cars pulled up. Gerald's face went pale as the agents approached him. Gerald Fitch, one of them said, you're under arrest for multiple counts of mail theft and tampering. You have the right to remain silent. As they led Gerald away, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of sympathy. He looked so small and defeated now, nothing like the tyrannical figure who had been making our lives miserable. But then I remembered all the stress he'd put us through, all the neighbors he'd intimidated over the years, and my resolve hardened. He'd brought this on himself. The aftermath of Gerald's arrest was like a shockwave through Oakwood Estates. An emergency homeowner association meeting was called, and attendance was higher than I'd ever seen it. People who had been too afraid to speak up before were now sharing their own stories of Gerald's abuses of power. It turned out the mail tampering was just the tip of the iceberg. He'd been embezzling homeowner association funds, selectively enforcing rules to target people he didn't like, and even falsifying documents to keep himself in power. In the end, the homeowner association board was dissolved, and a committee was formed to draft new bylaws and elect new leadership. To my surprise, several people nominated me to be part of this committee. You stood up to Gerald when no one else would, my neighbor Tom said. We need someone like you to help get this place back on track. I was hesitant at first, but Sarah encouraged me to do it. You've already made a difference, she said. Why stop now? So, I accepted. Over the next few months, we worked to create a more transparent, fair system for our community. We reduced unnecessary restrictions, implemented checks and balances to prevent any one person from having too much power, and set up a community forum for people to voice concerns and suggestions. As for Gerald, he ended up pleading guilty to multiple charges. He was sentenced to two years in federal prison and ordered to pay restitution to the homeowner association and affected residents. The last I heard, he'd moved in with his sister in Florida after getting out, apparently deciding that retirement communities were more his speed.
Looking back, I never expected that buying our first home would lead to taking down a criminal and reforming an entire community. But I learned some valuable lessons through it all. First, standing up for what's right isn't always easy, but it's always worth it. There were times when I wanted to give up, to just sell the house and move somewhere without a homeowner association. But by persevering, we not only solved our own problem but helped a lot of other people too. Second, community matters. Once people realized they weren't alone in their frustrations, they found the courage to speak up. Together, we were able to make real, positive changes. And finally, I learned that sometimes, you have to fight fire with fire, or in this case, fight underhanded tactics with a little ingenuity and some blue powder. These days, life in Oakwood Estates is pretty good. Our new homeowner association system isn't perfect, but it's a far cry from the dictatorship it used to be. People actually wave and smile at each other now, instead of eyeing their neighbor's lawn suspiciously. Sarah and I are expecting our first child next month. As we prepare the nursery, I can't help but feel grateful that our kid will grow up in a neighborhood where people look out for each other, instead of living in fear of a tyrant with a ruler and a clipboard. And every time I check the mail, I smile, knowing that the only hands touching it are those of our friendly local postal worker, and mine. You know, they say that good fences make good neighbors, but in my experience, what really makes good neighbors is a willingness to stand up for each other, to work together to solve problems, and maybe, just maybe, a readiness to get a little creative when traditional methods fail. So if you ever find yourself facing your own Gerald Fitch, remember, sometimes, justice comes in the form of a blue-handed homeowner association president being led away in handcuffs. And let me tell you, that's a sight sweeter than any perfectly manicured lawn. Update, update. It's been two years since the whole Gerald Fitch fiasco, and I've got to say, life in Oakwood Estates has taken some interesting turns. Remember how I mentioned Sarah and I were expecting our first child? Well, little Emily is now a toddler, running around and keeping us on our toes. It's amazing how much can change in such a short time. As for the homeowner association, we've made some real progress. The committee I joined worked hard to overhaul the entire system. We rewrote the bylaws, focusing on fairness and transparency. Now, instead of a single president, we have a five-member board that makes decisions collectively. Every major change requires a community vote, and we hold monthly town halls where residents can voice their concerns. But here's the kicker. About six months ago, guess who decided to move back to Oakwood Estates? That's right, Gerald Fitch himself. I was grabbing the mail, ironic, I know, when I saw a moving truck pull up to the house three doors down. At first, I didn't think much of it. We'd had a few new families move in since the homeowner association reform, and it was always nice to see the neighborhood growing. But then I saw him step out of a car parked behind the truck. Gerald Fitch, looking older and a bit more hunched, but unmistakable. I won't lie, my first instinct was to march over there and tell him he wasn't welcome. But I took a deep breath and reminded myself that we were supposed to be better than that now. Instead, I went inside and called an emergency meeting with the rest of the homeowner association board. Guys, we've got a situation, I said once we were all on the video call. Gerald Fitch is moving back into the neighborhood. The reactions ranged from shock to anger to disbelief. Can we stop him? Tom asked, after everything he did. I shook my head. Legally, we can't prevent him from buying a house here. He's served his time, and as long as he follows the rules like everyone else, we don't have grounds to exclude him. But what if he tries to take over again? Sarah, another board member, asked. That's why I called this meeting, I said. We need to make sure we handle this right. We can't stoop to his level, but we also can't let him undo all the progress we've made. We spent the next hour hashing out a plan. In the end, we decided on a two-pronged approach. We'd treat Gerald like any other resident, giving him a fair chance, but we'd also stay vigilant and document any rule violations or attempts to manipulate the system. The next day, as the official representative of the Homeowner Association Board, I went to welcome our new, old, neighbor. Gerald's eyes widened when he saw me approach. Mr. Thompson, he said stiffly, I suppose you're here to run me out of town. I forced a smile. Actually, Mr. Fitch, I'm here to welcome you to the neighborhood. Things have changed a bit since you were last here. I'd like to give you our new welcome packet and go over some of the changes in our homeowner association structure. He looked suspicious but took the packet. As I explained our new system, I could see the gears turning in his head. I half expected him to start arguing or trying to find loopholes, but he just nodded along. Well, he said when I finished, it seems you've been busy in my absence. We've tried to create a fairer system for everyone, I replied. I hope you'll find it an improvement. He gave a non-committal grunt. We'll see about that. Over the next few weeks the neighborhood was on edge. People watched Gerald like hawks, waiting for him to step out of line. But to everyone's surprise, he seemed to be keeping to himself. Then, about a month after he moved in, I got a call from our local park committee. Gerald had volunteered to help with the annual spring cleanup. Are you sure? I asked, certain I'd heard wrong. Yep, said Linda, the committee head. He showed up this morning with work gloves and everything. Been raking leaves for the past two hours. Curious, I headed down to the park. Sure enough, there was Gerald, looking decidedly less dapper in jeans and a t-shirt, 
filling bags with dead leaves and litter. I grabbed a rake and started working nearby. After a few minutes, Gerald spoke up. I suppose you're wondering what I'm up to, he said, not looking at me. The thought had crossed my mind, I admitted. He sighed, leaning on his rake. Prison gives a man a lot of time to think, Mr. Thompson. I've done some reflecting on my actions and their consequences. I stayed quiet, waiting for him to continue. I'm not asking for forgiveness, he went on. But I am trying to. What do they call it? Make amends. This neighborhood was my home for a long time. I'd like to contribute to it positively for a change. I nodded slowly. Well, this is certainly a good start. We worked in silence for a while longer before he spoke again. I have to admit, the changes you've made, they're not bad. It's more work, certainly, but it seems fair. That was the goal, I said. We wanted everyone to have a voice, not just one person calling all the shots. He nodded, a hint of a smile on his face. Yes, I can see that now. It's refreshing? From that day on, things in Oakwood Estate settled into a new normal. Gerald continued to volunteer for community events, and slowly, people began to lower their guard around him. He never tried to run for the homeowner association board or push for any major changes. Instead, he became known as the guy who always had tools to lend out and who kept an eye on his neighbors' houses when they were on vacation. About a year after Gerald's return, we had another situation that put our new system to the test. A developer tried to buy up several properties on the edge of our neighborhood to build a strip mall. The old homeowner association would have either rubber-stamped it for a bribe or shot it down without discussion. But we did things differently now. We held a series of town halls, inviting the developers to present their plans and allowing residents to voice their concerns. We looked into the potential impact on traffic, property values, and the overall character of the neighborhood. In the end, we negotiated a compromise. The developer agreed to scale back their plans, preserving more green space and agreeing to architectural styles that fit better with our neighborhood aesthetic. In return, we approved a smaller commercial area that would bring some convenient shops and restaurants within walking distance. The day of the final vote, I was surprised to see Gerald stand up to speak. I just wanted to say, he began, looking a bit uncomfortable with all eyes on him, that I'm impressed with how this situation was handled. In my day, this would have been decided behind closed doors. But this way, everyone had a say. It's a better outcome for everyone. As he sat down, I caught his eye and nodded in acknowledgement. It felt like a final closing of an old chapter and the beginning of a new one. Today, Oakwood Estates is thriving. Our little compromise strip mall has become a popular spot for community gatherings. We've started an annual neighborhood festival that brings everyone together, and at the last homeowner association board election, we had more volunteers than open positions, a far cry from the days when we could barely get anyone to show up to meetings. As for me, I'm still on the board, but I'm looking forward to stepping down next year to make room for new voices. Sarah and I are thinking about having another kid, and I want to be able to focus more on my family. Looking back, I never could have predicted how things would turn out when I first caught Gerald stealing my mail. But I've learned that sometimes, the worst situations can lead to the best changes, if you're willing to stand up, work hard, and give people a chance to do better. The other day I was out front, teaching Emily how to ride her bike without training wheels. Gerald walked by and waved. She's getting big, he called out. They grow up fast, don't they? I smiled and waved back. That they do, I replied. As I watched him continue down the sidewalk, I thought about how far we'd all come. It wasn't perfect, nothing ever is, but we'd built something pretty special here in Oakwood Estates. And in the end, isn't that what community is all about? Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.